Hi, I'm Zach. Welcome to Westby. Did you know that the Greek word for servant is diakonos? That's where we get the word deacon. We are now accepting nominations for new deacons. If you know a true Christ-like servant and would like to submit them for consideration, please complete the form at deacons.westby.org. Your input is appreciated as we move forward to add new deacons to our church body. Save the date of Sunday, April 10th for beach baptism at Bayfront Park in Anna Maria. Who wouldn't want to be baptized at the beach? I mean, come on. Go to baptism.westb.org or call the church office. Can't wait to see you there. Announcing new Wednesday night classes. A new lineup is now available. Check out all adult life groups by visiting wednesday.westb.org. Join classes now. You might be wondering what we're doing for the people of Ukraine. Our church is partnering with Send Relief, an organization that has already provided assistance to over 91,000 refugees. If you'd like to learn more, go to sendrelief.org. You can give online directly, or if you prefer to give to the church and designate to Send Relief for Ukraine, we will make sure those funds get there. We're all praying together for the peace in Ukraine. That's it for now. Let's worship together. In our modern context, an identity crisis occurs when you struggle with your purpose. You are challenged with a, with a sense of self. Like, who am I? The idea of an identity crisis actually comes from the world of developmental psychology, particularly a guy by the name of Eric Erickson, who defined eight crisis stages that characterize our lives from birth through death. And if you look at the fifth stage, this is the concepts of identity achievement and identity diffusion. In essence, either you will come to terms with your role in society, you, you'll have a sense of achievement, or you will not be prepared for the future stages of life, diffusion. There's a lot of science behind all this, of course, but according to Erickson, it is possible to stay and a permanent sense of crisis. Now, obviously, that's not what we want for people. So how do you get out of an identity crisis? Well, you replace uncertainty of self with a high commitment to purpose. Makes sense. The answer to personal uncertainty is commitment to purpose. The Bible has been teaching this principle. The Bible does teach this principle. Modern psychology is just catching up to the truth that's been there all along. God made an intentional commitment to create you. God made an intentional commitment to redeem you. God has committed to never leave you. Eternal certainty is found only in God. Let's think about marriage this idea of identity, understanding who we are. So in marriage, you do the actions of love and the emotions will follow. You don't base a marriage on your emotions. You're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble and in a lot of arguments. You do the actions of love and then you feel the emotions of love. If you base your purpose on how you feel, then you will always feel uncertain. The only way to find certainty is through commitment. As the time of the judges closes and the book of 1 Samuel opens, the people of Israel are struggling with an identity crisis. They don't know who they are. They are uncertain about their role in the world. Why? Because they had not stayed committed to God. 
Think about how Joshua ends, Joshua 24, 15. We've looked at this passage before, but it's a, it's a good reminder. Joshua ends with a very clear identity. Joshua knows exactly who he is. Choose today whom you will serve, but as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. He knows exactly who he is. Why? Because he's committed to God. But look at how the book of Judges ends in Judges 21, 25. In those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. They did whatever was based on their emotions, and they lost a sense of who they are. So last week, we looked at how the people of Israel lose their moral compass, and then they lose their identity. Today, we're going to begin this new era of the kings leading Israel. And it is going to be uh, quite a season for them. They're going to have some good kings and some bad kings. We'll be looking at many of them uh, in the next couple of weeks as we walk through this era of the kings. As Israel became a nation, there were leadership offices established by God. So you have judges. The, the, the judges delivered the people politically, usually from other nations. So they would, you know, the, there would be surrounding nations that would attack and the judges would be responsible for freeing the people. You also have priests. These are the gatekeepers of the law, the gatekeepers of sacrifices and offerings and feasts and worship. And you also have prophets. They delivered God's messages to the people. They were forth tellers in that they spoke the truth for that time. And they're foretellers in that they foretold the future. The role of prophecy in the Bible, by the way, is that twofold purpose. And we'll, we'll talk more about it when we get to the books of prophecy, but it's just as much about living righteously today as it is understanding the future. That was the case when the prophets of Israel spoke to the people. But where we are right now, as 1 Samuel opens, the people wanted to be like surrounding nations. The, the other nations had a king, so the people of Israel wanted a king. And the story in 1 Samuel begins with Eli. Eli was a priest and a judge, and he did his job fairly well. He had integrity as a leader, but he was not a good father. His two sons would end up abusing their leadership offices, and they would take advantage of the system, and they would bring God's judgment. But Eli would find redemption, and he would find redemption in raising Samuel for leadership. Samuel was not his biological son. Samuel was born to Hannah, who had been childless for quite some time, and then God blessed her with a child, and she dedicated Samuel to serving God even before he was born. It's a fascinating story at the beginning of 1 Samuel. So if you read 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare, and visions were quite uncommon. So the people are not living the way that they need to live, Therefore, they are detached from God. But God begins to speak to Samuel, even at a young age, because he was committed. The sooner you commit to God, the more likely you will hear from him. Let's think about how we raise our children. And I understand every kid is different, every family is different, and parents do different things. I, I get all that. But I think about the children in our church and the students being raised in our church, and these early commitments are very important. And, and God can work through anyone at any time, and you can come to Jesus at any point in your life, and you can get right with God, whether you're young or you're old. But when you are raised in the church, when, when you have an understanding of that commitment from a very young age, there's, there's some good things that God does through that. God can use any generation. But he is clear in his word about training the next generation. Let's go to Psalms. Look at Psalm 78. And I'm, I don't, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but let me read just the first eight verses here. Psalm 78, verse 1. O oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I am saying. For I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories we have heard and known stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them. 
even the children not yet born. And they will in turn teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, and unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. Clearly, the Bible champions this idea of raising the next generation to love God. And we should have high expectations of our children, our students, and anyone that would want to be a part of our church. Now, there's a theory out there, not to bore you too much with science, but I find science interesting. There's this theory called the theory of institutional strictness. And it's very simple. The more you expect of people in the church, the more likely they are to stay committed. Now, how about that? Raise the bar of expectations, and people are more likely to stay. Lower the bar of expectations, and people are more likely to leave. Now, I don't want to champion legalism. That's not what I'm talking about. But this is about development, maturity, discipleship. High expectations mean better discipleship, better assimilation, better spiritual growth. Low expectations, well, if you have low expectations of people, why, why be committed if the church doesn't care about progress, right? I mean, if, if somebody comes to the church and says, well, all right, I'm ready to serve. Well, you know, it's not a big deal. You just do whatever you want to do. We don't really place a high standard on people. Why would you be committed to that? No, you want to join the team that has the coach that expects to win. You want to go to the school that has the best teachers because they want to train up children in the best way. It's the same for the church. Now, we have high expectations here, and when we have high expectations, people are more likely to stay. Eli's biggest fault was not expecting enough of his children, letting them develop detached from God detached from his people. This is part of the reason why it's important to be regular in church. If you're not, there's a detachment there. The people of Israel face tragedy at this time. The Philistines attack Israel, and unfortunately, Eli's sons are killed in the battle, along with about 30,000 others. The Ark of the Covenant is stolen in this battle, and that's kind of a, a symbol of spiritual deterioration. Uh, Eli gets the news. Uh, he falls back in his chair. He breaks his neck and he dies. It's just this horrible tragedy. This guy who was leading so well, it all falls apart because he didn't invest in his children. So Samuel becomes Israel's judge. Samuel becomes Israel's priest and prophet. But he does the same thing as Eli. He leads the nation well, but neglects his home. Samuel's sons abuse power. They pervert justice, and frankly, Israel had had enough. This is why they wanted a king. The leadership had failed them. One of the best ways to serve God is to lead your children to Christ. That's the, one of the best ways to serve God, is to disciple in the home. Leadership begins in the home. Discipleship begins in the home. I mean, just think about the passage in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 3, 5. For if a man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? Now, this is about pastors, but it applies to, to everyone. I mean, we are to make sure that to the best of our ability, we're raising children, we're raising the next generation in a way that honors God. Well, let's take a little deeper dive in 1 Samuel, and let's go to chapter 8. So let me read you the first nine verses of 1 Samuel 8. Now, you've got a little understanding of, well, why would the people want a king? Well, to some degree, the leaders had failed them. Now, their desires aren't exactly right either. So, let's, let's look at the story. 1 Samuel 8. As Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons to be judges over Israel. Joel and Abijah, his oldest sons, held court in Beersheba. But they were not like their father, for they were greedy for money. They accepted bribes and perverted justice. Finally, all the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. Samuel was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for they are rejecting me, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. And now they are giving you the same treatment. 
do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. So the nation of Israel is struggling with an identity crisis after the collapse of their society. Uh, Samuel is old. He's unable to, to lead like he did in the past. And he led well for 20 plus years, but very clearly the, the people there, I mean, they, they basically just tell me, hey, you're too old for this. And Samuel's like, yeah, well, I, I guess I, yeah, thanks for telling me. And he has a poor succession plan. Samuel's sons are not up to the task. And we see Samuel's reaction to all of this. It's displeasure. Now, his counter reaction is the right one, prayer. We will have reactions. We do have emotions. And in some ways, we can't help them. We're going to be displeased. We're going to be unhappy. We're going to be frustrated. Where you really shine in your spiritual maturity is your counter reaction. Is your counter reaction prayer? And in many ways, your counter reaction is of more importance than your reaction. We're all going to have our emotions. How do you respond to your emotions? We see here that Samuel did the right thing. Now, a little history as to what's happening during this time as Israel transitions from the judges to kings. Um, there are ancient Near East powers that are in decline, uh, nations like Assyria and Babylon and Egypt. But there is another nation that is less known in world history but was a pest to Israel. That's the Philistines. And the Philistines really aren't that prominent in the totality of ancient Near East history. If you're reading a, a you know, world history book, you know, they're there, but they're not that prominent. But they plagued Israel, which is why we see them a lot in the Bible. And it's, it's why you read much more about them in Samuel than perhaps other places. So the, the Philistines, they had a small kingdom, but they controlled the coastline trade routes that everyone used. So they were kind of a bottleneck in many ways. And if you weren't on good terms with the Philistines, trade was very hard. And Israel's solution to their identity crisis and the problems of the Philistines was not, hey, let's seek God again, but hey, we need a king. So God actually anticipated this desire. I mean, Moses prophesied about this day. And it's not necessarily the office of the king that is wrong. It's the the way that the people desired it. So let's look at Deuteronomy 17. Let's look at Moses' prophecy about the day when the people would desire a king. Uh, Deuteronomy 17, verse 14. You are about to enter the land the Lord your God has given you. When you take it over and settle there, you may think we should select a king to rule over us like the other nations around us. If this happens, be sure to select a king, the man the Lord your God chooses. You must appoint a fellow Israelite. He may not be a foreigner. The king must not build up a large stable of horses for himself or send his people to Egypt to buy horses. For the Lord has told you, you must never return to Egypt. The king must not take many wives for himself because they will turn his heart away from the Lord. And he must not accumulate large amounts of wealth in silver and gold for himself. When he sits on the throne as king, he must copy, for him, copy himself this book of instruction on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. He must always keep that copy with him and read it daily as long as he lives. That way he will learn to fear the Lord his God by obeying all the terms of these instructions and decrees. This regular reading will prevent him from becoming proud and acting as if he is above his fellow citizens. It will also prevent him from turning away from these commands in the smallest way. And it will ensure that he and his descendants will reign for many generations in Israel. So we see here some very clear guidelines. Don't accumulate too much wealth. Stay close to the people. Stay close to God. May it be a man of God's own choosing. I mean, there's some key things here. When you look at the kings and some future kings like Solomon, they fail a lot of these parameters. So the issue is not necessarily a king. The issue is the people didn't want to follow God first. The leadership was the leadership. And God had said, well, if you want a king, here's the guidelines. But they didn't follow the guidelines. Remember, Israel's purpose, the reason they are chosen by God, is to direct other nations to God's redemption. They're not supposed to be like other nations. They, they can't be the vehicle of God's grace while looking like everyone else around them. Israel wanted to be absorbed into the culture rather than be the messengers of God's good news to the world. You know, they, you know, they were like, well, we want, we want to be free of God's rule. And God said, okay then I'll punish you 
with the experience of getting what you want. And sometimes God will punish you by giving you exactly what you want. And that's what happened to the nation of Israel. When you are committed to God, you should stand out. You shouldn't be part of the culture. You should be a messenger in the culture. So how can I stand out? It's a good question. Well, there's some easy ways to stand out. Read your Bible every day. Pray every day. Disciple your family in the church weekly. Share your faith. Invite others to church. You may say, well, we know all that, but do you do it? If you do those things, you will stand out. So parents, we're, a lot of the themes of what we're talking about today is about raising the next generation. So let me just talk to the parents for a moment, especially you dads, but any parent. We, we don't do this enough. So tonight, do this. Hug your kids. Look them in the eye. Tell them that Jesus loves them and that you love them too. You should do that every night. You should show love to your children. You should tell them that you love them, and you should tell them that Jesus loves them too. We don't do that enough. And you say, well, that's very simple. Watch what God does if you do that every single night. Then pray with your children. Have them pray. You may say, well, I'm not very good at that. It doesn't matter. It's the fact that you're praying with them. And if you're really struggling with like, okay, how do I lead my family? Well, use our weekly devotional guide. We put it out every Monday morning. You can sign up at newsletter.westb.org. And if you really want to start doing some good stuff, sit down with your kids and just say, I learned something today about God. And then share it with them. I was reading the Bible today and I learned something. And then tell them what you learned. Ask your kids what they learned. Don't be like Eli and Samuel, successful with the job, but a failure at home. Success in the home can begin tonight. And I believe God will honor your effort no matter how far you are behind. If you're like, I've never done any of this stuff, start. Start by hugging your kids and just telling them that Jesus loves them. That's a wonderful start. If you go back to 1 Samuel 8, if you look specifically at verse 9, God told Samuel to warn the people about the demands of a king. And, and this is where we talk about transactional power, where the king will do things for you, but he's also going to require things of you. God is transformational. God is not transactional. God desires to do something new in you, and he's going to show you his grace. A king doesn't show you grace. A king will tax you and require you to fight battles for his riches. A king will take the best of what you own for his own. A king will even oppress. God wants to free you. God's not transactional. God's transformational. And rather than be committed to God, the people gave their loyalty to a king, and they became like everyone else around them. They thought they were free, but what came their way was an identity crisis. You will never find you if you're trying to be like everyone else. How can I know who I really am? Well, you find that only in Christ. Our identity is found in Jesus. It's found in his sacrifice for us, the fact that he died on the cross for you, that he shed his blood to forgive your sins, and that he rose again to give you life, and that if you repent of those sins, believe in him, he becomes your Lord and Savior. He's also your identity. Think about Romans 12, 2. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Saul becomes king in 1 Samuel chapter 9. We learn why. He looked the part, but he didn't have the heart. His reign started well, but his poor character eventually caught up to him. Saul eventually would commit suicide after a long downward spiral of sin. When Jesus was crucified, the soldiers responsible for prepping the criminals, they twisted thorns together and made a crown for Jesus that pierced his skull. Then they spit on him. They mocked him. 
They mocked his claims of kingship. Hail, King of the Jews, they mocked him. The sign above him on the cross read, King of the Jews. But the story does not end in sadness. The crucified king on a cross would exchange the crown of thorns for a crown of glory. In the Old Testament, the leaders of the people were prophets, priests, and kings. Prophets spoke God's words to the people. Priests gave God's sacrifices on behalf of the people, and kings ruled over the people as God's representatives. These three offices foreshadowed Christ's role in our lives. He is prophet, priest, and king. Prophet, he is the word. Priest, he is the sacrifice. King, he is the one who reigns and rules over us and everything else. What crown are you wearing? What takes supreme place in your life? Are you willing to lay down your crown to serve the kingdom of God? It's exhausting to pursue any other crown that does not come from King Jesus. Hebrews 2, 6, what are mere mortals that you should think about them or a son of man that you should care for him? What are mere mortals? This is a quotation of David's poem in Psalm 8. God is under no obligation to think about us, and yet he does. God is under no obligation to care for us, yet he does. None of us have a crown of glory. We lost it in sin. And we keep trying to coronate ourselves with other crowns, and we're just wearing ourselves out. Only the king can return your true crown. You have to accept the king to receive it. He wore a crown of thorns to remove the curse of sin, and now you wear a crown of glory to reveal his power. How do we know this king? By God's grace. That's Hebrews 2.9, by God's grace. He takes off the old. He takes off that sinful crown, and he puts on something new. He puts a new glorious crown on us. All of us will have an identity crisis unless we identify with the true king. The answer to who am I, this identity crisis that you can have, that the answer to who am I, there's only one answer. There's only one true answer, and it's found only in the I 